Hi, I'm Joe Sorge, and I have a question for you. Would you sell your children for money? Crazy question, right? But what if I told you there's a country where people make money, a lot of money, taking a child away from a parent, and the government allows it? In fact, in that country, government officials can take money from the traffickers who deal in this business. You'd probably say, that's horrific. We gotta put a stop to that. What country is that in? Let's write to the UN. Well, I'm standing in that country right now, and I didn't have very far to travel. Think I'm crazy or exaggerating? Well, let's look at some of the facts that I've dug up, and then we can reevaluate. There are 17 million children in the United States whose parents live apart because of divorce or separation or because they were never married. We have the highest percentage of children living in single parent households in the developed world, nearly three out of 10 households. And the trend has been increasing for the last 50 years. You might ask, how did it get this way? What is it about the United States that causes it to lead the developed world in single parent households? Let's take a look at some history. 50 years ago, women rarely worked outside the home and their primary role was to raise children. If a couple divorced, it was just assumed that the man would find a new wife, the woman would find a new husband, the new husband would adopt the children, and then both families would begin to have more children. Any obligation to pay alimony or child support would typically end upon the first wife's remarriage, and so these payments would usually be temporary. But things have changed. People today are far less likely to remarry and adopt a set of children, and this has led to an explosion in the number of single-parent households and a prolonging of the payment obligations. Other social trends are changing too. Women now make up half our workforce and over 70% of married households have two wage earners. Mom is no longer making apple pie and waiting for the children to get home from school. She's out at work, just like dad. Men now help more around the house and with the children. And this has strengthened the bonds between modern fathers and their children. So have the US divorce laws been modified to adapt to these rapidly changing social trends? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Our laws still assume that one parent will stay at home and watch the kids and the other parent will be off at work earning money. In fact, an entire divorce industry has evolved to help people fight over who gets control of the kids. Because getting control of the kids means you're entitled to collect money called child support from the breadwinner, even if you earn just as much as the breadwinner and send the kids off to daycare. Our family courts spend countless resources choosing a primary parent, and our federal laws and regulations concerning child support and custody are riddled with the terms custodial parent, code for homemaker, and non-custodial parent, code for breadwinner. And to make matters worse, a huge government bureaucracy exists to promote these concepts of custodial and non-custodial parent and to assure that tens of billions of dollars of child support are transferred from the person who has been labeled the breadwinner to the person who has been given control of the children. The result is that we have a $50 billion a year government industrial enterprise whose primary mission is to take children away from one parent and give them to the other parent. Because if they don't follow the federal rules about putting the children under the control of just one of the parents, the states lose billions of dollars coming from Washington, and the attorneys lose a lucrative business. And that's why we lead the world in single-parent households. Money. Worse yet, the federal government has thrown gasoline on the fire by penalizing the states if they don't collect more and more money each year from the non-custodial parents. Federal dollars are tied to so-called child support enforcement performance measures. So the states have been acting like hungry wolves in search of prey. I know, I'm still sounding crazy, but let's roll back the clock a little bit and see if we can make some sense of this. Laws were passed in the 1970s and 1980s to deal with what, at the time, was called the deadbeat dad problem. In poor communities where families collected welfare, it was particularly difficult for single dads to earn enough to support two households after a breakup. If their wives had left them, these marginalized men would often vanish, leaving the taxpayer to support the family. Given the huge rise in no-fault divorces, this didn't sit well with the taxpayers, and they demanded a solution. So in 1975, the federal government created the Office of Child Support Enforcement and passed laws under Title IV-D of the Social Security Act. Under this program, the federal government would grant states $2 for every $1 the state spent to collect child support from dads whose families were receiving welfare. By 1979, the taxpayers were actually benefiting from this program. The feds and the state spent about $200 million a year to administer the program and collected $700 million from the dads. So the taxpayers recovered about a half a billion dollars. Not bad. 
a good deal for the taxpayers and for the families. In fact, the program became so popular that politicians jumped on the bandwagon and decided to expand its scope to the middle class. Admittedly, many non-welfare fathers were not paying all of their child support in the 1980s. 38% of the awarded money was not being collected, and it was just assumed that even middle class dads were shirking their obligations. And so the federal government began to grant the states additional bonus payments for increasing child support collections, above and beyond the two-for-one matching funds. But here the federal government made a tactical error. Instead of incentivizing the states for every dollar of previously unpaid child support that they could collect, they incentivized the states for any dollar of child support they could collect, whether from paying parents or from deadbeats. The states quickly figured out that they could bring in more federal dollars by tapping into middle-class child support payments, especially those that were being paid regularly, even without the aid of government intervention. And so they went into the business of collecting middle-class child support with a vengeance. The state agencies hired tens of thousands of collectors. They went from spending about $200 million per year to about $6 billion per year. But shockingly, even though they spent huge amounts to collect child support from the middle class and started to lose billions of dollars of taxpayer money in the process, their efforts didn't make a real difference. 38% of child support still went unpaid. How could that be? Spending all that additional money? Yet the average proportion of unpaid child support remained the same at 38%. If we look at the amount of child support actually collected in relation to award size, we see that compliance is greatest when awards are affordable. But as child support awards begin to exceed what a person is reasonably capable of paying, compliance goes way down. It's really pretty simple. You can't squeeze blood from a stone. So you'd think the states would have recognized this and put a cap on the size of child support orders to keep them in the affordable range. But instead, they decided the best way to handle this would be to throw the payers who had fallen behind in a debtor's prison. You heard me correctly, I'm not making this up. We still put tens of thousands of people in prison for falling behind on their child support payments, even people who earn less after taxes than the amount of their child support orders. And not only did we take away their ability to earn a living by locking them up, we also take away their driver's licenses and professional licenses and make it so that they can't see their children. Here's a piece of an interview that I did with Charles Lohr, an ex-deputy sheriff with a spotless track record. He lost his job because he was thrown into debtor's prison after he was ordered to pay more than he earned. They, they order you to pay more money than you make. They say that you can't, if you can't pay it, they're going to throw you in jail. And then when they have you in jail, they take away your driver's license. So when you do get out of jail, you're breaking the law if you drive to go find work. At that point, I had been in jail 10 months, five days, not charged with a crime, and not given a release date. The system, in my case, has set me up to fail. I, I look at it as they, they figuratively speaking, they, they cut off your legs and expect you to run a marathon. Sound counterproductive? Sound destructive? Is there a better way? As many of you know, I've interviewed lawmakers from other countries to find out how they handle these issues. Here's a response from a senior member of the Danish parliament when asked how they handle the situation when someone falls behind on child support payments. If the, one of the parents doesn't fulfill the payments uh, for the child support, then uh, of course that can also be enforced by the authorities and uh, it can be taken directly from this person's salary just as you take the taxes. We don't have a situation that is similar to the United States. Uh, uh, we can't take people's uh, driving license or professional licenses, we can't take people to jail. We don't have a debtor's uh, prison in, in, in Denmark, so we can't use uh, that kind of an instrument in order to enforce the payments. In the meantime, back in the United States, research data shows that imprisonment of child support providers significantly reduces the amount of child support paid, as if that should not have been obvious to anyone with a pulse. Fortunately, some of the more rational minds at the U.S. Office of Child Support Enforcement have recognized that we have a problem. A proposal has been floated to amend the Title IV regulations so that the states will have less of an incentive to overburden one parent with an unreasonable child support order. We've examined the new language and think that it's a baby step in the right direction, but it does nothing to take the dollar sign off the backs of children. Why not fix the problem entirely while we have a chance? Let's tell Washington what we think. We need a lot of people to write in to get their attention, so please help. 
If you click here, it takes you to our web page, which makes it easy to send the message to Washington. Or if you like details, continue to watch this video for more specifics. This is what our federal government proposes, and these are the revisions that we think make sense. The government wants to continue calling one of the two parents a non-custodial parent and continue to place the entire financial burden on that parent. We think that's a bad idea. It essentially means that there will continue to be a senior parent, the homemaker or custodial parent, and a junior parent, the breadwinner or non-custodial parent. We should erase this 1950s concept from our laws while we have a chance, because it no longer reflects modern society where 70% of families have two wage earners. Plus, most modern research shows that children do better when they interact with both parents. It also shows that parents are less likely to be deadbeats when both parents can spend significant time with their children. So we propose getting rid of the antiquated custodial and non-custodial concepts, and given the prevalence of two earner households, we think both parents' incomes should be factored in when computing child support. We also think it's important to define income. Give the lawyers a vague definition and they'll fight over its meaning. Let's make the meaning of income clear. Absent outright tax fraud, it should be what each parent reports on his or her tax returns. This next change is going to be a big one. So I want to make it clear it's not intended to be retroactive. If you already have children, this change is not going to affect you. Our research shows that far too many custody battles are about money. We want to take children out of the middle of a financial battle between the parents. We want to take the dollar sign off the backs of the children. They don't deserve to be the collateral damage of a financial tug of war. Recent research from the National Institutes of Health has shown that the mere establishment of a court order for child support is correlated with problem behavior in children. Therefore, we're proposing the child support be based on the cost of raising children and not on the concept of alimony. If the parents want to battle over alimony, that should be a separate issue but there should be no hidden alimony to fight over in child support formulas. We have studied the formulas in the Scandinavian countries where they have separated the concepts of alimony and child support. Here's how they compute child support. If you earn around $60,000 a year, you pay around $200 a month. If you earn above the, let's say, 100,000, it goes up to two times the amount. And if you're above um, around $150,000 a year, it goes up to three times. And if you're above the $200,000, $250,000 a year, it could be four times. Even though the, the, one of the parents earn $10 million a year, child support would never exceed around $800 a month. There's one major difference, though. The Scandinavian government supplement daycare costs. So we propose that the U.S. child support formulas be based on the average cost of raising a child plus half the daycare costs if both parents work. We also propose that alimony be factored out of the child support formulas by tying the formulas to a more affordable percentage of income and not to exceed the costs of raising a child. So let's sum up the rationale for our proposed changes. We believe the U.S. leads the world in single-parent households because our laws financially reward the parent who files for divorce and wins custody of the children. In addition, if we follow the money, we see that the custodial parent can give some of the child support to the attorneys because the laws put no restrictions on how that money is spent. Unfortunately, these legal professionals are allowed to give money or extend offers of employment and other favors to the judges who make the custody decisions. It's no surprise then that the legal bar associations consistently lobby for single parenthood, and the reason is obvious. It generates business. In its worst embodiments, our system equates to a cash-for-kids scheme that might be compared with child trafficking elsewhere. It's for these reasons that we are recommending our proposed changes to the federal regulations. We believe these changes are essential to taking children out of the middle of their parents' financial issues. We don't want to be known as a country that equates children with money or that promotes single parenthood, do we? Less conflict over time with the children can only be in the children's best interests. And it can help the parents co-parent more effectively as well. These recommendations are good for the children and good for the family, and so we hope you'll click through to our website and let Washington know. Comments are due before January 16th, 2015, so please act now. 
I'm Joe Sorge. Thank you for your time.